Awesome. Thanks, Sai. That's amazing what JetBlue is doing with the Lakehouse AI and Generative AI. Super, super cool. OK, so we're short on time. They tell me we're behind, so I have to talk really fast. OK, so we're super excited. Lakehouse, best place to build, secure, train your own AI, your own generative AI, so we can democratize that. But that's actually just one small portion of the Databricks Lakehouse. Uh, there are many, many different applications on top of the Lakehouse you can build. And I want to quickly just go through some progress that we've had recently. Delta Live Tables are streaming engine, structured streaming. Uh, is amazing. It's on fire. We actually have over 54% of our customers actually using it. So a lot of people are you know, excited about generative AI, but they're not paying attention to how much momentum streaming applications actually now have. Uh, it's actually 177% growth just in the last 12 months if you just look at the number of streaming jobs. A lot of this is thanks to Project Lightspeed, which is making the latency of structured streaming shorter and shorter and faster and faster. OK, so that's just streaming. Databricks workflows is actually the underpinnings of most of the data processing that happens on the lake house. So a lot of people, again, don't pay attention to this. But uh, Databricks workflows has now over 100 million weekly jobs. That's two exabytes of data processed every day. So that's 2,000 petabytes of data every day that it processes. So this is essential uh, to everything that we do at Databricks. Uh, and then finally, our data warehouse is actually the thing that I'm the most proud of. Uh, you heard Larry at JPMC. They're getting fantastic results internally on the data warehouse. We have over 4,600 customers that are actively using it. Uh, you know, we've actually shared. It's approaching 10% of our revenue. So it's amazing. We're very, very excited about Databricks SQL. Um, but what I'm really excited about isn't the data warehouse that we built on top of the lake house. I'm really excited that the research that's happening at Databricks on how you can actually take data warehousing and data processing to the next level. Generative AI and machine learning actually offers an opportunity to do things completely differently from all the research that has happened in the last 40 years on data warehousing. So I want to welcome to stage my co-founder and our chief architect, Reynold Shin, who actually has a PhD in database technology, on stage to tell us what he thinks about that. Hi, hi. Thank you, Ali. All right, just a little bit of warning first. This is going to be the most technical keynote. I'll show you some math. We'll read some papers together. It's very unlike any other of the talks that you've seen this morning. All right. So the field of data management, or uh, what some people know as uh, databases or data warehousing, really started about 50 years ago when Ed Codd published a seminal paper that won him a Turing Award. And the name, title of the paper is Relational Model of Data for Large Share Data Banks. As you can see, he wasn't even using the term databases or data warehouse before because that, they, they weren't even terms back then. It was data banks. Now, the very first sentence of the paper also happened to be the most important sentence in my mind. It says, future users of large data banks must be protected from having to know how the data is organized in the machine. Right. What Cobb was really arguing for was to raise the level of abstraction so systems become easier to use. Now, Scalabish. The, uh, the smoke's actually, I can't even see you anymore, but let's put up some show of hands. Um, if you ever had to uh, do physical layout optimizations yourself, if you ever had to add a partition, if you ever have to cluster a table, you ever have to index a table, put up your hand. Now, I can't really see. Um, <laughs> a lot of hands, all right? Now, please put up your hand again or keep your hand up. If that very optimization you have done actually slow down some queries, or was more expensive than you thought they were? Hands. Almost no hands. Oh, there's a lot of hands now slowly going up. Now, as you can see just from the show of hands here, we haven't really fully realized Cod's vision. Because if we had, then there will be no hands up for any of this. All right. So now let's try to understand this from a more technical level. What's going on? Given this uh, very simple query, select star from events, where usually ID equal one, two, three. Um, how would you speed it up if you're managing the underlying system? Well, it's very obvious. You would add maybe a partition um, by this table by a user ID. But you don't always just run one query. Sometimes your user runs another one. Um, for example, this time filters by event ID. What would you do? Well, in most cases, you'd probably add an uh, index by or a cluster by um, the event ID column this time. But these two optimizations you have done um, actually have significant risks in, in introducing uh, performance regressions for other queries or incurring extra costs. The ultimate problem is that for every row you insert here, 
it might actually trigger some index update, this additional workloads that's coming on to the system, or it might trigger a repartition of the whole system. And the technical term for this is called write amplification, which means you write something, the actual write is substantially larger than what you would expect, so it gets amplified. And to really speed up these queries without incurring extra costs, without incurring slowing down some other queries, you have to understand a lot more about your workloads on the underlying system. Now, my interpretation of COD's vision is really uh, ideally you want all three out of your data systems, your data warehouse. You want it to be fast, you want it to be easy, you want it to be cheap or cost effective. But the reality is you can only choose two out of three, um, typically because of performance or cost. And these trade offs now become knobs that are extremely difficult to tune. And even worse, to really tune them, you have to understand the underlying system, your workloads, and the systems are far dumber than you think they are. So take the query optimizer as an example. The query optimizer is perhaps one of the most important components in a uh, database or data warehouse. Typically, users uh, issue a uh, specified declaratively what they want um, the results to be, what they want to query. And there are multiple ways of executing that query. The query optimizes the one that consults the cost model and determines how to most efficiently execute that uh, very query. And it does so by estimating the cost of the different ways of executing it um, and picks the, uh, sort of the most efficient plan. So the foundational paper for query optimization, there's a lot of uh, history we're reading here, uh, goes back almost, again, 50 years ago and was published by IBM Research in 1979. And this paper, uh, if you haven't read it, it's actually very, very simple to read. There's really only two tables that uh, you need to look at. Um, it explains how to model cost um, of any query. And let me give you a concrete example. Again, just the query was shown before. The way that 1979 IBM research papers um, decides to model the cost of this query is to uh, uh, determine the cost as one divided by the cardinality of uh, user ID, which means how many users do you have. For example, if you have 100 million users, this would be 1 divided by 100 million. Now, I can see so a few of you in the front. I'm the only people I could actually see the face. Um, it's kind of confused, but, but how is that possible? Um, for example, let's say we're on Twitter. Elon Musk has 150 million followers, and uh, Renault has I don't know how many, uh, but probably substantially less, or some no-main person. You can't possibly assume they would emit the same number of events because one divided by user ID knows nothing about the actual user itself. Right? So the model is assuming uniform distribution because it does re not really know much about the data. But um, now some of you might wonder, hey, that was a paper from 50 years ago showing me sort of some dinosaur age stuff by uh, IT standards now. Uh, we must have made a lot of progress since then. Well, in some sense, you're right. There's been thousands of papers, research engineering team that published in the last uh, 50 years. Um, to improve this. But a few years ago, a research group from TU Munich um, evaluated the most popular open source and commercial systems, database systems, and they found that 25%, if you can't read the chart, it's OK, they found that 25% of the queries are misestimated by six orders of magnitude. Six orders of magnitude is a million times, all right? If you make an estimate in your job that's off by a million times, you'll be fired. <laughs> but when it's a database or a data warehouse is doing that, you now have to learn how to deal with it. Um, but and it's not just the query optimizers doing this. As a matter of fact, look at every single component in a data warehouse. You realize it's full of heuristics-based algorithmic approaches. They're wrong all the time. Now, so just to summarize the first half of my talk, um, basically after 50 years of research, we have yet to realize cost vision. And that boils down to two problems. Trade-offs in performance and cost really are leaky abstraction. They become knobs that are very difficult to tune. And to make matters way worse, the underlying system uses heuristics-based algorithmic approaches that don't really work and falls apart for real-world queries. Now, we're at the Generation AI conference here. Um, this seemed like the perfect problem for AI. Mankind have run a lot of queries, so it's plausible we have a large training corpus. And these workloads are complex, so you, it's hard to model with just heuristics that were set. And workloads tend not to change dramatically over time. Um, they might change in seconds, but they don't change in nanoseconds or milliseconds, which give us a chance to learn. 
Now, we're not the first one that had this idea. Um, just a few years ago, a research group from MIT and Google actually collaborated and published the paper, um, The Case for Learn Index Structure. So the first sentence that we posited our existing index structure can be replaced with other types of models, including deep learning models. Um, one of the authors actually joined Databricks uh, a couple years ago. The, um, but one other thing that's interesting is that um, despite that paper and a lot of other follow-up research papers, there haven't been a lot of real industrial use. Even within Google, they have not put that paper into production. Um, and we're trying to understand why. And it's actually pretty simple. Um, just like any applied machine learning or AI problem, it goes far more beyond just, hey, let me develop some machine learning model, experiment with it, put it in production, um, and just have it make decisions to tune a few knobs. As a matter of fact, the breakthrough of Gen AI comes from large amount of data, large amount of compute. And one of the things really, we, as we embarked on this journey a few years ago, uh, we realized, hey, we have so much more to actually make progress on this problem than the research groups, even research groups within Google that don't have access to real-world workloads. Um, we have the most diverse workloads on the lake house on the planet, going from heavy ETL workloads to interactive queries to uh, sort of very low-latency BI workloads and machine learning workloads. And this uh, workloads launch billions of containers. They've run trillions of queries. They've scanned zettabytes of data. Right? For those of you that are familiar with zettabytes, it's a, um, a million petabytes. So we've been revamping data systems in the last few years using AI models trained on real-world workloads. So here's how the system looked like at 20,000 feet level. This is a keynote tower, after all. I can't show you all the components. Um, we're reinventing data warehousing using Lakehouse AI. So the engine is written from scratch. This is the core data warehousing engine. It's written from scratch to emit far more telemetry than we ever did in the past to generate way more training data. Um, it incorporates small AI models for making decisions in real time, but it also consults the model serving endpoint that Casey just demoed for more sophisticated models. And this is in a closed loop, which means as the engine emits telemetry, it gets evaluated, and the model learns on the telemetry and feeds back into the engine itself. And it becomes smarter and smarter over time. So today, I want to give you three examples of problems we're solving, index list, indexes, data layout, and workload management. You might ask, hey, what the hell does index list, indexes mean? Reynolds can't even pronounce the first word properly. All right, is that even a word? <laughs> um, so let's think about what data warehouses make you do, all right, in the problem we talked about earlier. You have to analyze, if you're a DBA, you analyze your workloads. You try and look up what tables you need to index, and you act the index for them. And in some data warehouses, they don't have indexing, but they have optimization services. Um, and then you pay additional time to understand, hey, once I create the index, is it backfiring? Is some workload becoming slower? Um, so we call it never-ending grief loop of DBAs. For this query, basically, data warehouses tell you you have to choose two out of three. You can be fast and easy by just ignoring costs and creating indexes left and right. Or you can be fast and cheap by doing very complex tuning, really try to understand your workflow in the system. It's not going to be easy. Or you kind of just put up your hands and say, hey, whatever. Um, it would be super easy to maintain the system. It would be super cheap. But then your users are having really terrible experience because all the queries are super slow. Now, what if? What if you don't have to create an index? What if your system could learn which data is needed for your queries? anticipate what you need next? What if the queries are just fast, without knobs, without any of the indexes? What if you can get all three, fast, easy, and cheap? So using AI, we built this new breakthrough called Predictive I.O. It triangulates exactly where your data might be for both reads and writes, and can speed up your queries by an order of magnitude without any manual tuning for selective queries. On the screen, you can actually see a benchmark comparing the selective queries performance on DBSQL with predictive I.O. rolled out versus a leading cloud data warehouse uh, performance with what they call search optimization service, um, which actually costs a lot of money to uh, uh, use. And using AI, predictive I.O. gives you the performance of the uh, indexes without manual tuning or creating indexes. That's why I call it indexless indexes. The, uh, we got a lot of customer interactions all the time, but my favorite of all time is actually this. Um, one day, a solution architect, Woosman at Databricks, started paying some of us and said, hey, there must be a bug with a new version of our Databricks SQL. 
Um, Sean, let's look at it. So we got this important customer. We got a lot of people looking at it. And then it turned out, OK, this customer's query got 35 times faster overnight. Um, and the customer thought there must be a bug. What happened was actually predictive IO's AI model learned about the workload and automatically speed it up. All right. But it was so fast that people thought <laughs> there must be a bug. The second example is that data layout optimization. It is fairly typical in data warehouses or data lakes. As you have more and more data, you have to think about how do you cluster your data, how do you maybe choose the right file sizes in data lakes. Um, and those are fairly complicated because, again, there's no one-size-fits-all. Um, so we're rolling out a new feature called predictive optimization that learns, again, based on your workloads. And you automatically choose the right file size for compaction. If you have gigantic tables, it would be larger sizes. If you have small tables, it would be smaller sizes. You pick the right clustering um, properties for you. You do the automatic statistic collection, so you don't have to worry about this. We started previewing this um, feature last month, and every customer in the preview program loved it. They see substantial performance improvement um, and while reducing their costs without them having to do anything except just accepting to be in the preview program. So as an example, Anker found that predictive optimization sped up their queries by more than 2x while cutting down their storage costs by 50%. This is actually a real chart from the S3 daily storage cost. So last example, the last example is intelligent workload management. So the conventional way, again, in data warehouses to do uh, workload management is you would uh, define queues or priorities, and you sort of send the queries to different uh, maybe queues or priorities. Um, or in some modern data warehouses, you can create different warehouses and ask your customer or users to send uh, queries to different uh, warehouses. This puts a lot of burden on everybody. The, uh, the lake house can do better. And again, we build AI models that learn automatically based on your workloads. And we use that to automatically determine how to prioritize them. And this means now you can send mixed workloads to the same endpoint without having to worry about, hey, is my larger queries going to slow down my slow queries? So I have limited time on the stage, and I can't go into details. But there are, if you're interested in learning more, there are two talks tomorrow that I would encourage you to go to. Um, the, uh, but these are really just three examples using AI to dramatically improve the performance of the systems. We feel only scratch the surface. I'm not going to be like or IBM or Oracle that have told you in the years of 2000s that we have solved all problems with AI. As a matter of fact, we're only getting started. But we're confident that with AI, we can finally crack the code. And with the right architecture, we can dramatically improve the systems for the years to come. We might actually be able to re um, realize COD's vision. And, or put it differently, we're going to reinvent data warehouses using Lakehouse AI to make it fast, easy, and cheap. Thank you very much. Thank you.